I, uh, I'm told that the delay is due to some late uh, documents. There's a couple of documents that the next witness um, would like to refer to, which I think are very useful documents, and we're just arranging for have, to have those redacted appropriately and scanned. But we'll start the evidence first, because we won't get to them till, till the end of Maria's evidence. Very well. Uh, and she wishes to be known as? Maria. Maria. Maria, please. Repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Maria. Sorry. You you have a condition called beta thalassemia major. Yes. Could you tell us what that is? Um, it's a, a blood disorder. Um, I've forgotten now. Um, I was born with a blood disorder called thalassemia major, um, which requires me to have regular blood transfusions. Um, I've had this since the well, I was diagnosed at the age of one, so since birth. Um, it's usually a, a Mediterranean Asian disorder that affects us people. Um, I'm and yes, basically I was born with this disorder which requires me to have regular blood transfusions. And, and the, the, the um, consequence of the disorder is that you, you don't pr produce enough haemoglobin. Yes. And that's why you need to have regular blood transfusions. Yes. Um, I can't, as, as you said, um, I can't produce red blood cells. So I need um, my body, well, I need blood transfusions to help me, uh, to move around to... Uh, um, otherwise, if I, if I don't have the blood transfusions... Uh, I'd, my energy levels are very low, non-existence, and I would probably die. And so since you were diagnosed at about the age of one, you have had blood transfusions throughout your childhood and adult life? Yes. Very frequently, sometimes as, as, as often as every two or three weeks? That's correct. Y you also have to have injections to uh, regulate the amount of iron yes. in your blood? Yes. Um, Basically, uh, because blood's got a lot of iron, um, it affects all the major organs in your body. Um, so, uh, through over the years, at the age of five, I've started having injections, and then from injections, it was they were 24 hours long, over a period of five, six days a week. Um, to get rid of the excess iron in my body because, as I said, it affects the heart um, and, and many uh, and most of my other organs. And you've also um, have regular liver biopsies. Yes, I used to have uh, regular liver biopsies. Um, when I was young, it was to they wanted to detect the 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 iron damage in in my liver um, so every few years they were well, every year it was it would I would have to have a liver biopsy to detect the, the, the damage that was caused and you've produced a document that relates to one such biopsy we'll have it on screen please Paul it's one eight seven six zero zero three sorry I think I've got that the wrong way around one eight yeah, that's right, good. Uh, and we can see that this is dated the 29th of January 1986. Um, it's headed University of Wales College of Medicine Department of Haematology. And we can see it refers in, in the first paragraph to the biopsy. 
And then in the final paragraph, it says this, I've assumed that this patient does not have infective hepatitis and is not positive for HTLV3. Would you please make sure that this is the case in future? Now, you're puzzled by this yes. document, aren't you? Why is that? Um, I, I didn't know anything about this. Uh, I didn't know. I mean, all I knew that my liver biopsies were going on off to be tested for iron damage um, but this uh, shows that they were testing also for hepatitis C which I was unaware and my parents were unaware of, of this. And you're also puzzled by the reference to it being from the University of Wales yes. because at the relevant time your care was entirely un under University College Hospital to which the letters yes, directed. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and you've also, in your witness statement, attached some significance to the fact that this demonstrates a knowledge of hepatitis in 1986, not yes. specifically in relation to, to you at that time, but more generally. Yes. Now, you were indeed infected with hepatitis C in consequence of the blood transfusions that you've received. Yes. Uh, and uh, if we have up on screen, please, Paul, uh, 1876... 007. We can see this is a, a letter from 2007, but we'll just look at the first paragraph for the moment, please. Um, second sentence, she first became aware of chronic hepatitis C in the early 1990s. She certainly acquired this through multiple blood transfusions since childhood, all of which were in the UK. She has no other specific risk factors for hepatitis C transmission. So there's no doubt the cause of your hepatitis C and you understand you've said in your statement that the blood that you received for transfusion was all via the Brentwood Blood Transfusion Centre. At that time, yes. Now, were you or your parents ever given any advice or warning or information about any risks of infection associated with regular blood transfusion? No. You were told of your hepatitis C diagnosis in early 1990, as far as you recall? Yes. What can you remember about that? Um, I was feeling unwell, very tired, feeling sick, just didn't have the energy to do everyday things. And I thought maybe it was to do with my thalassemia because uh, you get tired and... and uh, uh, out of breath, uh, but it wasn't. I used to have a blood transfusion, and instead of feeling energized, I was feeling very unwell and uh, feeling sick and 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 quite tired. And uh, so I went to my doctor, the hematologist, and uh, was telling him that I'm I'm not feeling right. Um, so. They then started to uh, do tests on me to, to see uh, if there was anything else at the time, thinking it might be diabetes related. Um, so, yeah, just feeling really not well and uh, very tired and, and, and sick. And you've said in your statement you kept going back to the doctor as you couldn't understand why you were so sick. And, and that was unlike you yes. because you, other than your regular treatment for your thalassemia, you wouldn't normally keep going to the doctor. No. Um, just, just was it feeling right? Uh, uh, something, as I said, you know, having my blood transfusion and not feeling energised where usually I would be feeling en energised and uh, so I kept going back to my doctor and they decided then to do tests, uh, random or different tests to see what was the cause of it and uh, then I was told I had uh, contaminated, I had hepatitis C through contaminated blood transfusions. And we'll just have another letter put up on screen, Maria. It's 1876010, please, Paul. We can see it's January 1990. Um, the, the second paragraph, 
uh, halfway down says, I suspect that she's developed post-transfusion hepatitis and explains that, that the doctor has arranged for uh, various tests to be performed to investigate the post-transfusion hepatitis and also contacted Brentwood Blood Transfusion Centre so that we can screen all potential donors for hepatitis C. And that's January 1990 that um, that, that is being identified. Your recollection, in fact, is not that you were told at that point that it was a possible diagnosis, but that you actually had it. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I remember uh, went for a clinic appointment and, and was told that I had hepatitis C through contaminated blood. And one of the concerns you've voiced in your witness statement is uh, why that took what you recollect to be about a year uh, of you going to the yeah. doctor for hepatitis to be identified yes, as the that, possible cause. Yes. Now, you, how did you react? What do you re recall the impact on you of being told this? Well, um, I didn't know anything about hepatitis C. I didn't know any of the other patients had <laughs> hepatitis C. Um, and it, I was in clinic appointment and it was like, oh, by the way, you've got hepatitis C and sort of brushed under the carpet, didn't explain what it meant to me, what it would mean, what um, I thought it was just something that I, uh, that I got with everything else and basically accept it and uh, move on. And, and did you um, get given sufficient information in your view about the nature of the condition or any risks of infecting others? No, I didn't get, uh, wasn't told anything about uh, what I needed to do, uh, what the risks were to others. Uh, and it was over time that I, I started to understand more of what the risks were. And uh, I was, you know, 20, 21, I think, at the time that I was diagnosed. And uh, just basically it was as if just get on with your life and, and uh, let's see what we're going to do about, you know, what, what's going to happen in you know, the outcome of it. You've said this in your statement, Maria. The fact that I had the infection was brushed under the carpet. I did not think it was serious because of the way the consultant dealt with it with me. He did say that if I came to it, I could just have a liver transplant. Yeah. This shocked me, but still I did not appreciate the seriousness of the condition. It was like I just had to accept it and get on with it. Yes. Um, I don't know if... I was told, and uh, it wasn't... You know, it was like, because I had heart failure at the age of 16, I was given a, a week to live. And uh, it was hard enough dealing at the age of 16, having to deal with, you know, heart failure and thalassemia, and you've only been given a week to live, and... Um, Basically, it was just, I, I pulled f through that, and it was quite an ordeal. And uh, as I was getting my life together and, and starting work, um, it was something that I just had to deal with, basically. Uh, and you've also said in your statement you were given no information about the risk of, to others no. of becoming infected. And then you've said this, everything I know about the infection now, I've taught myself through research and attending conferences and speaking to others who carry the infection. Some of my best friends have died from it. My very best friend passed away nine years ago. Yes. Um, yes, basically, uh, it was through the conferences, the thalassemia conferences that we had, um, and that I learnt from, uh, I learnt about the hepatitis. We weren't given a leaflet to say, you know, the risks. 
um, the type of treatments because it was a while after that that I started my first lot of treatments. Uh, so it was through learning online, uh, le mainly at the conferences, and it was just as if it was another thalassemia-related issue, and and uh, and basically not not enough information and not enough information from the hospital, the doctors to to tell you more what you know what can happen and what the risks are. Now, you said in your statement that as far as you're aware you've been infected with hepatitis C only but you n no longer have confidence yeah. about the possibility that you might have or not have other viruses and so you always fear that something else will be revealed. Yes, um, you know, uh, I've lived with thalassemia, I've lived now with hepatitis, that's, uh, I've cleared it up finally. But you don't know what's around the corner because there's always going to be something I fear that it could be either from having a blood transfusion or just something that my body uh, needs, or, you know, the requirements that I need to go through in life, I, I think. Um, so yes, I don't know what's around the corner for me, for my life, uh, and to do with illnesses. And do you continue to have to receive blood transfusions on a regular basis? Yes, um, I go to, I have blood trans, two units of blood every three weeks at the moment, um, and it depends on uh, how I'm feet my body if I've got any infection or anything I might need to have blood more frequently and that's likely to continue for the rest of your life yes you you were 21 or almost 21 when this news was given to you about hepatitis C uh, how did it affect you first of all physically well physically um, as I said very tired and uh, you know, living with two conditions, thalassemia major and hepatitis. Uh, it was quite stressful for my body and uh, the treatments that I've had to go through and the effects that those treatments have caused me, um, which were terrible, uh, and, and uh, I had to give up work because of the treatments, hepatitis C. Um, you know, I had a, a very good job and uh, uh, with a big cosmetic company in it and then being diagnosed with hepatitis C and then, if, you know, during the time that I was working, I had to start treatment uh, and... Uh, Treatment wasn't given to me straight away when I was diagnosed. I waited a few years. Um, by that time, I started getting cirrhosis of the liver. Um, and uh, the treatments affected my life. You've undergone five courses of treatment. Yes. In the early 1990s, you had interferon yes. for about six months and ultimately it made you extremely ill. You developed other infections and you could no longer tolerate it. Yes. Um, my first lot of interferon, I was working. Um, it was terrible. It was uh, injecting, I think, ever three times a week. Um, and the side effects, I mean, I used to have put it in, inject myself. And uh, I just wanted to lie in my bed and, and curl up. And uh, le just let time go by until the next lot of treatment. And it just made me very ill, um, sick, 
shivers, temperature, my neutrophils used to drop, which that caused that could cause me very bad infections. Um, and doing the treatment and the first lot and after I think three months results came through and it was uh, the virus had come back. It was undetected during the treatment and then three months later it had to come back. You embarked upon a second load of, um, of treatment, interferon and ribavirin, uh, uh, and you also had to stop that treatment again because of the side effects. Yes, um, again, the, the treatment mentally and physically, my body couldn't take it. Um, it was just very difficult. Neutrophils used to drop. I had to stop it, start it, stop it, start it. I wasn't getting the 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 full lot uh, of treatment to be effective for me. Um, we and mentally, uh, the pain, the, the physical pain of the um, you know temperatures, body aches flu-like symptoms all the time, all the time, and going to work, uh, and uh, just, it was very hard, very hard. You tried again a third time, uh, it with pegylated interferon and ribavirin? Yes, pe and uh, again, and I think this, the symptoms and mentally I was getting depressed, um, and this is when I had to give up work, um, you know, I remember crying uh, as I was uh, going home. I was talking to my manager at the time and and uh, saying to her, uh, um, I didn't tell her I was on uh, hepatitis treatment. Um, they knew about thalassemia, but I couldn't. I didn't feel I had. I was able to tell them that I had hepatitis C um, for, because of contaminating people um, and I just remember ringing her up as I was going home and uh, I said look I can't work anymore I'm just uh, on treatment it's really really hard on me and I'm all over the place not thinking right and uh, I think I need to take time off while I'm on this uh, this treatment and um, because I can't do both I, you know I'm not not right mentally and, and physically and the stress it was putting on me and having had to take that difficult decision Maria were you able to work again no after that that was well I still didn't clear hepatitis after the third lot of treatment um, I didn't know how long it was going to take for the next lot of treatment. Um, I wasn't able to go to work, no. And, and it was a number of years, 2013, when you tried your fourth course of treatment. Uh, you persevered for 33 weeks. Yes. But you had similar problems to those you'd encountered previously and yes. ultimately you had to stop it again. Again, um, they put me on antidepressants. My mood check, my I had lots of bad mood swings. Um, remember, my mum was over, and uh, I was getting upset with her for no reason, shouting at her. Uh, it was just uh, hard to deal with everything around, and plus deal with the thalassemia. And and uh, also with the hepatitis and and uh, also at the time of uh, when I was diagnosed with hepatitis, I was diagnosed with diabetes. So dealing with everything and having heart trouble as well, it was just it was too much. Finally, uh, in two thousand and sixteen you attempted your fifth course of treatment for hepatitis C, this time with Harvoni. Yes. And that treatment has cleared the virus. 
Yes, it has um, cleared the virus. Um, it was uh, basically they the 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 hep I moved to Leicester at that time. Well, for uh, six years ago, and um, I moved hospitals. I couldn't keep commuting to London as it was too much too much uh, it was making me really tired um and I had to go to uh the hospital in Leicester for my thalassemia and for all of my conditions and uh had to go to the hepatologist department and uh basically um I had to fight to get that treatment um because at the time I was going, uh, I before that I was going through IVF treatment for trying to have a baby, um, and then uh, that didn't work, um, and so I thought now I need to have uh, clear up the hepatitis because it was it was a big impact on my life. Uh, big impact with my family life uh, uh, I my husband had has a, a daughter and I needed you know constantly I was afraid that I might infect her um, through because I'm diabetic I need to prick uh, and blood withdraw blood to check my my sugar levels um, and I constantly do that at 10, 20 times a day sometimes, depending on how, uh, if I'm feeling well or, or not, I need to check my sugar levels. And I was checking, uh, keep doing my bloods, and I, ha I was always constantly aware that I might drop some blood uh, and infect my family. And uh, so, yeah... Um, Going back to, uh, yeah, so basically I, w I needed to clear up hepatitis C. Um, and uh, I went to see my, uh, I was referred to the hepatologist in Leicester and uh, he did me a, a fibro scan, and, um, which I've never had in London uh, before. And he goes, oh, we need to check. It's like... It's it's not as bad as having a biopsy, which I thought great. Um, so I had the fibro scanned and uh, went back to see the doctor after the, the scan, and he goes to me, "Well, um, I've got good news for you. Your fibro scan shows that you're six and you're not twelve. Anything above twelve, that's when we consider giving treatment." Uh, would give you Harvoni, but we feel that it's not needed uh, because you you haven't you haven't got so much liver damage, and um, well I go to him. Well, I I don't understand that because I've had a number of biopsies shown grade one genotype one uh, grade one hepatitis cirrhosis of the liver, and. Uh, he goes, oh, your liver's probably because you've been uh, doing your desfra, the, the iron chelation, um, probably because you've been doing that more. It's, uh, it's made your liver better. And um, I go, well, no, because I've been diagnosed as severe cirrhosis of the liver. And then I went home, looked on about fibro, fibro scans and they're not as um, it, they're not uh, the results aren't as great as a liver biopsy and so went back to the hip, uh, hepatolo um, no the hematology just at the time and she goes to me no Marie you need to have a uh, you need to go on this medication and I'm going to write to the hepatologist and tell them that 
um, you need to start treatment because you've got thalassemia and because of the cirrhosis of the liver. So that she then wrote back to him, and then when I went back to see the hepatologist, he goes, "Yes, sir. We'll we'll do you. Your, we'll put you on at Harvani as soon as it comes available for you." So he had to put an application or whatever he had to do, um, and then a few months after that, they decided to start me on. I, I, and I should say that we, we've received, as I think you know, but you haven't had a chance to look properly at them, a couple of statements from the hospital in Leicester in response to certain concerns you expressed in your statement. Yeah. I'm not proposing to ask you about those, but as a matter of record, they're there and, um, and will be published in due course. C can I ask you, uh, uh, Maria, about the psychological and emotional impact of the, the years with which you've uh, had hepatitis and had to undergo these multiple treatments? How's that affected you? Well, it's affected me in uh, many ways because, you know, five lots of different treatments and they weren't, it wasn't a simple treatment. It was going to the hospital all the time, every week, getting bloods done. On, on uh, the fourth treatment, um, I needed to be on a special diet. Was it feeling well, shivers, aches and pains, mentally? Um, I just, it was very, very difficult and it had a lot of impact on my body. And um, and I, I believe it's still, after being cleared of hepatitis C, it still has an impact on my body um, because now I've, developed a neuropathy um, and I get terrible pains in my hands and my feet, burning sensations, um, just uh, not being able to sleep at night, uh, my husband not being able to touch me because of the pain, uh, pains that I'm in. Um, and I, I think it still has, it's still affecting me. And, and you've said in your witness statement, um, in, in terms of the, both the physical and uh, mental uh, impact upon you, physically I'm tired, I'm tired of it, it's totally and utterly drained me. You described feeling drained for years, not having the strength for a normal life. It's like I've had my life sucked out of me. And then you've described your memory being affected, your concentration, uh, feeling like you're in a constant daze, brain fog. Yes. Um, and like now, I can't remember a lot of things. Uh, my brain's all fuzzy. Um, and it's, it's just, it, it, it's draining. And I've been on the treatment is draining and you know needing blood more blood transfusions because I used to get anemic more uh, so I used to have blood every 10 days rather than every three weeks um, you know my neutrophils going down to like next to nothing you know being scared that I might get an infection from someone that's just had a little cold um, uh, and it's uh, affected me mentally and physically, and and uh, and I still believe it's affected me now. What's the impact been on your family and personal relationships? Well, you're always scared to to tell. It's bad enough you've got thalassemia, and it's a blood related illness, and. Uh, that's bad enough to tell someone that, and because I live in a, I'm, my community is, uh, oh, you, blood, uh, you know, thalassemia was a big thing for them because it's related to blood. Um, classed as uh, a disabled, uh, shouldn't, I shouldn't be alive. Um, uh, you know, my, my, 
them telling my mum when I was a young age. Um, and the relationships, you know, I, would, I it, it got moving on to relationships, uh, telling my husband. Um, I didn't want to tell him because, you know, he, you know, about telling him thalassemia was easy, but telling him about hepatitis as well, um, it has a very big, big, big Im impact and influence in, in people's lives. And uh, people run them all. And you didn't feel able to share information about your hepatitis C beyond your immediate family and friends? Yes. Um, I couldn't tell, apart from my fam, my mum, my dad, my brothers and sister, um, and my close friends that have thalassemia. I couldn't tell someone that I, I've met that I've got hepatitis um, because it's it's a, a disgrace in you know that I've been brought up that it's not a nice nice thing to have and um, that shouldn't be here. And you it said in your statement it's also affected your relationship with your stepdaughter because you've felt the need to be on, on constant watch, super vigilant yes, about uh, razors, toothbrushes and, and the diabetes testing that you've identified. Yes, um, you know, I had to be constantly making sure that uh, she, she doesn't use my razor blade because, I, you know, we've, but then now I, I've mo I move my razor blade so she can't, um, that she will can't touch it, uh, you know, she might accidentally get my toothbrush. You're always aware of uh, blood testing and making sure I haven't dropped any blood on the floor, which it can happen, and I'm on blood thinners as well, so you bleed more easily and, and uh, you know, you prick your finger and uh, it hasn't stopped bleeding and you might just accidentally touch a a glass or something you're you're afraid that you know that you might contaminate them and you've uh, uh, explained how you had to give up work because of the treatment but prior to that you hadn't felt able to share with the people you no. worked with I couldn't your condition I couldn't tell them I mean they they were wonderful with the thalassemia and, and me having when I needed time off but I could never have shared that I had hepatitis C, especially um, because I, it was skincare that I was working with and and touching people. And if I can't, if I had a little scratch or something, I, I can't imagine. Uh, you know, it just it was very difficult to say. The um. I wanted to ask you about the financial assistance uh, that you'd attempted to obtain from the, the funds. You've identified in your witness statement a number of financial consequences of your condition, the having to give up work. You say you, you got into debt because you weren't then able to uh, meet the mortgage payments. Uh, you've identified the expense of insurance and travel insurance. What's your experience been of trying to obtain financial assistance from Skipton and, and Caxton, first of all? Well, um, it was, it, it's difficult. It's like you have to beg them for something. I tried uh, getting financial support for, uh, for IVF treatment. Um, and I... Uh, got a letter, supporting letter from my GP um, and they wouldn't, they, they didn't want to know um, and it is part of, uh, I have hepatitis C and it's not easy for me to conceive um, so they just didn't want to know at all so that went out of the, the window um, 
you know, I wasn't able to get a mortgage uh, because hepatitis C. I wasn't able to get travel insurance because of hepatitis C. It was, um, I wanted to go to Australia to see uh, my friend and uh, I thought I'd try to get travel insurance and once I told them I had hepatitis C, they quoted me something ridiculous, like £2,000. And I, I thought, no, I'm just going and whatever happens will happen of me. Um, so it was a, a struggle. I was living on uh, my benefit. Um, and uh, I had, uh, because I uh, sort of medically retired, I was uh, getting paid from my work, a pension. But it wasn't, I wasn't able to meet up payments that I had living on my own of a mortgage and, and the rest. Um, so it was a, a very hard. You've received some payments um, from the Skipton and the Caxton Foundation, uh, but you've d described feeling that you've had to, to, to beg and yes. prove your entitlement. You had particular difficulties in relation to dental care and access to yes. dental care. Um, when, uh, um, when in London, uh, during my hepatitis, uh, when, uh, well, when I was living in London, uh, I, was getting, I was going to Eastman's Dental Hospital and they were treating me. And because of the hepatitis, I was getting lots of mouth ulcers and... Uh, and mouth problems, and uh, and when I moved to Leicester, I have to pay for my dental treatment. Um, so I asked if I can uh, get uh, because uh, on their an um, NHS or EIBBS, um, they got they got a one off grant where they cover for dental dental, and all I want is. When I go and get my, have a hygiene and, and see the dentist every six months, if they could cover my costs. But because I haven't proved that it's from uh, due to hepatitis, they, they wouldn't pay for it. Now you've, you've referred to the problems you have with pain in your legs. Yes. And, and you've described in your statement that they're restless and ache most of the time. Uh, and you have insomnia as a result. And, and you made an application to the EIBSS for a one-off payment to try and get a, some kind of specialist yes. bed. Yes. Um, uh, could we have up on screen, please, Paul, 187611. It's one of the two documents that should have been sent while Maria's been given her evidence. Thank you. So this is a letter from your or consultant haematologist in support of your application. And it says this... Um, uh, Mrs. Fletcher contracted hepatitis C from blood products some time ago and remains on treatment. As a result of the hepatitis C, Mrs. Fletcher experiences constantly leg pains and cramps. This is likely to be caused by hepatitis C-related neuropathy. Since starting treatment, she's also been experiencing increasing generalised body pains. We therefore support her application for funding for a specialist bed that may help improve these symptoms as well as Mrs. Fletcher's quality of life. So that's the a, le a supportive letter you've got yes um that's the requirements for them that you provide a supporting letter to state that my pains my neuropathy is likely caused by hepatitis c which i believe it does because i've never had uh, this kind of problem before um and it's only since coming off harvoni that i've started to develop these problems and and they're not Little pains are quite, quite bad, and um, anyway, I sent that uh, letter, and uh, they um, replied back with uh, another letter saying that they want more specific details. We'll, we'll put that other letter, the response you received pr pretty recently, twenty yes, ninth May. Yes, it was. Yes, it's one eight seven six zero twelve, please, Paul. And it says this. Uh, thank you for your application for a specialist bed and mattress. I've reviewed your application and can confirm we would require some additional supporting evidence in order to fully consider it. 
that being a medical recommendation confirming the type of bed required due to the symptoms you having as a result of the infection. Although the medical letter you sent to us states that you suffer from leg pains and cramps, it does not detail the requirements you have as a result of this. An application may be considered where the medical recommendation links the need for a specialist mattress to your hepatitis C infection. The recommendation should detail which symptoms are caused as a result of the infection and what the requirements of the mattress would be to alleviate these ailments. The quotes you provided may be acceptable. However, this would depend on any updated medical recommendation we receive. Any quotes must meet the requirements detailed in the medical recommendation. <coughs> so you've got to go back to a consultant haematologist and ask for recommendations about the type of bed that you might require and the details set out in this letter. Yes. And how does that make you feel, Marie? I'm angry because I, I, I'm wasting doctor's time to, to write me a letter where this <coughs> letter should be more than enough stating that I am having problems uh, and I have problems sleeping and, uh, and they want... They want more informa information, and I, and I think that's so unfair because I wouldn't be here if I didn't receive contaminated blood. I'll be working, um, and I had a very nice, uh, a lovely job, and um, but I'm asking for some help, and they want more. And the other concern you've expressed in your witness statement about uh, the, the financial assistance schemes is you say you, you don't know what assistance the funds actually offer, the extent of the help that they offer. This has never been made clear to me. I find the process of applying extremely difficult, especially because I'm sick. I always feel as though I should not ask. I think it is made purposely difficult so that people give up. When you do ask and when you do not ask for assistance... I am confused about this. There is no clear guidance. I always feel like I'm made to beg for it. Yes, I mean, that's how I'm feeling. That That's not good enough. And if I want a bed, bed uh, I need to ask for more and beg, basically, to get a bed. Um, it, it's, uh, it makes me feel that I, I, I can't ask again. I understand from your statement, Maria, that in relation to your thalassemia, you have received uh, over the years some form of psychological counselling and support. Yes. Has that ever been made available to you in relation to the hepatitis C and the treatments you've undergone? Never, undergone? never. Do you think that that would have been helpful? Yes, I think, especially at the time of doing five lots of treatment, that uh, I should have had some support there. Um, you know, I, had, I was quite upset, a lot of pain and and taking it out on the people that I love. Um, and also the stigma behind it all, um, dealing with it and dealing with others to telling them that I've got hepatitis C and it was okay to tell others that I've got hepatitis C. It wasn't, you know, counselling would have helped. You made reference earlier in your evidence to um, when you were going through IVF uh, and you've explained in your witness statement that the issue of your hepatitis C infection played a large part yes. in, in that, but the way in which it was dealt with was very clinical. Yes. What, what did you mean by that? Um, you know, you were contagious. Uh, we, they have to be careful. Uh, and, you know, when if I did happen to fall pregnant and what they would need to do um, in delivering the baby. Uh, so, yes, it wasn't... I wasn't made to feel, oh, you know, we're going to try and get you to have a baby and nice. It was, like, all very clinical and uh, had to be probably put in a sterilised room or something. Um so it just, it was quite hard. And, and you also said in your statement that when you attend the hospital, you feel that there are constant reminders of your infected status. Yes, even in, in, Infectious diseases unit is, is where you have to go. Risk of infection is, is something that's stamped on. Yes. Um, 
uh, when you have your tests? Yes, uh, basically when I had hepatitis C, my blood form had in bright yellow writing, uh, beware or con- uh, can cause contaminated uh, contamination. It, it had a bright yellow sticker, basically saying infected. Um, and the departments that I had to go to was infectious blood, uh, uh, infectious diseases. Um, so it was a constant reminder that I'm infected, and um, and it wasn't. It's not that I've been out uh, sharing a needle with someone, or I've been sleeping around. Um, it was a f- fault of my not. You know, it wasn't my fault that I received contaminated blood. And Leicester, and it's only been in Leicester that I've had blood forms saying infectious and infectious disease department. And and, and does, has that continued after you've cleared the virus? Um, on my blood form, it doesn't say that. But um, on my appointment letters, it says infectious in bold right and in infectious uh, disease department. Now, now, again, I think you know that there's been a statement from the hospital which says, well, they have to call it that and they have to have the stamps for public health reasons. But as I understand your evidence, your point is about how it makes you feel. Yes, and um, I, I disbelieve that because um, I didn't have that in London. And the last... I've only been in Leicester for five, six years, and they have that. Why is the two hospitals different in that? Why does it have to be, uh, in? well, my letter's infectious disease or infected blood on, uh, on my blood form? I, I don't understand that. Maria, those are the questions I have for you. Uh, is there anything further you'd like to say? Um... I just want to say that uh, at Leicester Hospital especially, that um, they need to see that I'm that I'm a, a person that has various problems and that um, I'm treated as, as differently, like basically you've got hepatitis and this is how we treat hepatitis patients. Well, no, I'm treated, I've got thalassemia that has problems that make hepatitis have more problems. And um, I like as to be treated as a whole person rather than a, a, a person that's got hepatitis. So I, I feel that they're, they're not doing that. Maria, I'm just going to turn my back and ask Mr Locke if there's anything further he'd yeah. like to have asked. Just one question, Maria, that, that Mr Locke suggests. Once the hepatitis virus had cleared, how easy was it for you to ensure that you received regular checkups after that? Um, at the beginning, when uh, I was told that uh, I was undetected, the, the consultant didn't want... He, he wanted to take me off his books, basically, and, uh, and uh, didn't need to see me again. I've had to say... Him, look, I've, I want to be. I want to have scans every six six months. Um, I want to make sure that my liver's okay because I've got cirrhosis of the liver, and I, I've known others that have had um, the hepatitis cleared, but they have passed away because of the hepatitis. And I just want to have constant care to make sure that that I'm treated ha- as a patient with other problems that can um, basically, with hepatitis, that I've got care all the time, every six months to have a scan, basically, and to be, you know, to show that it's all clear. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, do you have any questions for Maria? No, I, I don't. Um, thank you very much indeed, thank Maria. You. Thank you for listening to my story. I'm sorry it's not uh, 
as how I wanted it to come out, um, but it's just very difficult. Thank you. Well, we meet again uh, at uh, quarter past two, uh, and then we have... We have the evidence of Graham, Graham Manning. Graham Manning. Quarter past two.